Welcome back. I'm Michael Law from Waz of Mountain View Baptist Church in Ontario, California. Good to have you here uh, tuning into our program today. I don't know if we can say tuning in since none of us have a dial on our TV and you're probably watching this on your phone. But be that as it may, I guess that's just how we say it. Uh, first of all, I bring our attention to something I found in the ChristianPost.com. Uh, September 1st, 2019. This article is from today. And it's about J.D. Greer, the president of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. And he described three ways that American churches go wrong when talking about the issue of homosexuality. This is a hot button topic in our day, so I thought it was important for us to look at the three things that he noted um, are important points where the Christian church just goes way off the rails today and they go wrong when talking about these issues. J.D. Greer says, first, Christians go wrong when they think that God doesn't care about our sexuality. God, of course, does care, and he goes on to uh, give some verses about that, and we agree with him on that point. Now, his second and third points get a, a little more controversial. The next point that the president of the SBC made was that Christians go wrong when they think that same-sex behavior is a fundamentally different type of sin. In other words, homosexuality is a sin like any other, and so we should address it and approach it uh, like any other sin. Now, in Romans chapter 1, verse 27, Paul emphasizes the fact that, excuse me, in verse 26, Paul emphasizes the fact that for this reason, their suppression of the truth, God gave them up to vile passions. God gave them up. God gave them over. The Bible doesn't speak like this about all other types of sin. The Bible speaks like this when it addresses homosexuality in the book of Romans. God gave them up. Now, that should really throw up a red flag. This is not like any other sin. In fact, what this appears to be, rather than being like any other sin, this sin, the sin of homosexuality, seems to indicate that sin is so entrenched in a person's life that God has now given that person over to their sin and homosexuality is the outworking of the fact that this person has completely suppressed the truth of God. There are different types of sin. Uh, Jesus, when he spoke about punishment, uh, eternal punishment. He said some will be beaten with few stripes, others with more stripes. That seems to indicate to me that uh, God's, God is just, he is righteous, and so the punishment will fit the crime. And not everybody will be judged in the same way. Uh, also, remember how Jesus mentioned those who get in the way of children entering the kingdom of God. Jesus said those people are guilty of such heinous crimes against God that it would be better that a millstone was hung around their neck and they were cast into the sea to drown and die. Clearly, the Bible does not present every sin as being like every other sin, and we must be cognizant of, the, of that fact. Number three, uh, Greer said that we should not think in this way. Christians go wrong when they think that, oh, it's just, it's hard for LGBT people to get to heaven. Now, I understand the sentiment. We shouldn't be sort of singling people out and saying, well, it's, it's much harder for them than somebody else. However, Jesus, excuse me, said it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And when the disciples heard that, they said, well, then who can be saved? If, if a rich and, and wealthy and prestigious person, if it's hard for them to get to heaven, then how is anybody else gonna get there? Who can be saved? So I think it's proper for us to look at people who are further down the road of sin and to have grave concern. Yes, we have all sinned to come short to the glory of God. However, certain sins indicate that a person has been handed over to their sins because they have so suppressed the truth of God in their life. And I just think 
we need to have an approach that isn't a, 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 a one shoe fits all sort of approach. We need to have a biblical approach and we need to be able to look at these things um, case by case. Who is this person? What are they involved in? And let's preach to them where they are. I, I, I think we have precedent for that in the scriptures. Preach to people where they are. Don't, don't be generic. Don't say, oh, well, you know, any sin's just like any other sin. J.D. Greer went on to say, we don't believe your sexuality defines you. However, I think many in the homosexual community define themselves by this practice, by this behavior, by this lifestyle. I think it is something that they identify themselves by that. I am gay or I am a lesbian, I am transgender, and that's how they self-identify. And to ignore that, I, th I think, is a, is a little misguided. So anyways, I bring that to your attention. For the same reason I often bring things to our attention. We need to think theologically. We need to think deeply. We mustn't be flippant about these things. There are people out there that are hurting. There are people out there that need the gospel. And we, we, we mustn't treat the gospel as if it is some sort of a, a flippant message. We must treat the gospel with the respect that it deserves. And when we preach it, we must make sure that we are preaching it in such a manner that we are seeking to bring conviction through the preaching of the Word of God, to bring conviction through the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it should not come as a surprise that when Jesus himself preached the gospel of his kingdom, his first word was repent. And I think we're so concerned with saying, smile, God's, uh, smile God loves you, uh, God has a wonderful plan for your life, don't you want in? I, I think we sort of miss the foundation of the gospel, which is you're wicked, you're lost in sin, you must repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your savior. So let's think a, a little deeper uh, about these things. Number two, I was, uh, well, I guess I'm not startled by it, but I can't help but be surprised when people in our day act so immature, so emotionally. Um, when, when, we, when we see people who behave without really thought of, of the matter. Al Mohler, uh, president of uh, one of those seminaries down east, uh, down in the southeast, it's either uh, Southern Baptist Seminary or Southeastern Baptist Seminary, I forget which one it is. But anyways, he had put out on Twitter uh, this blurb. Americans are basically, by the millions, giving up on the fact that to be human is to be a parent. Eventually, to take on that respons responsibility to get married and have children, to take on the responsibility of passing on civilization itself. Now, Al Mohler has uh, been sharing this message for a long time. You can go on to his uh, website, look at his writings. Uh, he has often uh, harped on the fact that in the, in, the, in the 70s, you had a near 80% of people 20 to 54 who were married. And today, it's just over 50% of the same age group. Fewer people, by quite a, quite a margin, fewer people are getting married. And this even applies into the church today. And so he brought up that point, as he apparently has done many times in the past. Americans are sort of turning their back on the institution of marriage. But because he phrased it into what some people would say the wrong way, uh, he got some flack about it because he said, to be human is to be a parent. And that apparently hurt some people. Some people were just so discouraged by that. How, how could Al Mohler say that? Doesn't Al Mohler know the struggles that I have been through? Does it, doesn't, doesn't Al Mohler know that I, I want to be married or I wish I could have children and all that kind of a thing? And I, I noticed one of the people who responded to his apology, because he did apologize. Al Mohler said, not sure how to respond to some folks, but two thoughts. Number one, when a quote is from an article or spoken word, it might well be advisable to read or hear the source before going ballistic. 
Now that makes sense. Well, why don't you go look at the whole thing before you, you criticize the comment where he gives the context that I provided earlier. Uh, number two, quote blocks should be edited carefully. I own that one, thanks. So he even admits, look, I, I put that cool thing on Twitter and I should have been more careful how it was worded. I own it, thanks. But he didn't use the word sorry. And so one person said, oh, and, and she has, I, 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 she has this sad face on, on her little uh, Twitter icon. And she says, I, I think you misspelled, I'm sorry. I'm a Christian. I am infertile. It has been decades of painful struggle. Your words were incredibly hurtful to many people. Part of ministry is knowing how and when to say, I'm sorry. Number one, the Bible clearly tells us that we are to respect elders in the church. And I see here somebody who is condescending and she knows better than Brother Moeller and she's gonna tell him so. Honey, that's not your place. And the Bible says it's not your place. Number two, notice how this is completely emotional. She certainly didn't go and, and read the context of everything. She just saw the Twitter and responded with her own tweet. And she's just so upset and, oh, you have, you have caused pain to so many people because of your insensitive comments. Well, first of all, his point, uh, his point is that fewer people are even giving respect to the notion of getting married and having children. Um, respect that apparently she claims to give. I wish I had kids, but I, I just, you see the bleeding heart here. You see the emotion that is governing her response. It's not logical. It's not reasonable. It's not assuming that Al Mohler, a, a pillar of the Christian faith at this uh, Southern Baptist seminary, who's been faithfully serving the Lord for decades. Um, I don't know how old this person is, but wouldn't be surprised if Al Mohler has been serving Jesus Christ longer than she's been alive. That's very possible. Uh, the picture she uses is a youthful picture. Uh, she could be older, I understand that. But the point is, it, it's just about emoting and emotion and you hurt me. And then I understand that it is a painful struggle just like she says. But is that struggle to be projected into this instance? Is Al Mohler saying that if you're infertile, God hates you, or if you're infertile, you're not doing your job as a Christian, or if you're infertile, you're some sort of a lesser person? Is that what he was saying? Even in this quote that he says he should have wrote it better. Uh, is that his point? Or is his point a true point? Uh, we have a generation of people uh, maturing in our country who have no concern for raising up a family who have no desire to have a responsibility to a future generation. And yet all she can see, she's blinded by herself, what she suffers and everybody must be interpreted through her struggle. And that's just not a mature way to behave. It's, I mean, I know this is Twitter, but I'm using this as an example because I hope people that are listening to this video who are tuning in uh, to Mountain View Baptist Church, I hope we're understanding that as Christians, we need to have some maturity about our interactions with other Christians and of course, with other people. So, food for thought. Now, finally, we come to a, another article. Christianity, Christianity Today from August 30th, 2019. This I, I found fascinating. Uh, a new two-part study published in Christian Higher Education shows how common it is for students at evangelical colleges, Christian students who go to Christian schools, Christian colleges and universities to struggle with their faith. In fact, these students, evangelical Christian students at Christian schools, are more likely to feel unsettled about spiritual matters, unsure of their beliefs, disillusioned with their religious upbringing, distant from God or angry with God, 
more so than their peers at secular schools. That if this doesn't tell you the state of the church today and the type of children we are raising in the church today, I don't know what does. So these kids go to Christian schools and they bring all this baggage with them. And as they, in a Christian school, you have Bible classes, theology classes that are just part of the curriculum. And as they, for the first time, are actually challenged with the orthodox doctrines of the Christian faith, Oh, this is a struggle. Oh, I didn't know the Bible taught that. I, I, I didn't know Jesus preached that. I didn't know the scriptures said those things. And they're like, oh, I'm struggling here. I, I can't believe this stuff anymore. And it's incredible uh, that more so than Christians, evangelicals who grow up in church and go to Cal State Fullerton or UCR or, or some public institution, Christian kids who go to Christian schools are struggling with their faith in greater numbers than their peers who are at public schools. Whereas kids who grow up in a Christian bubble, in a Christian church, maybe with some shallow theology, and then they go to a Christian school, well, all of a sudden that school says, okay, it's time to study theology. And they're like, what? It says that in there? Oh, I didn't know we were supposed to believe that. I don't think I can believe that. And so, uh, the lady who did this study, she said she found that students at evangelical schools experience unique patterns of religious struggle. We need to be careful about the Christian bubble we have for our kids. I, I think it's good that we shelter our children. I mean, you, you look around at the world and it's, it's a filthy, vulgar place. And I think kids should grow up sheltered. But they should not grow up not learning the scriptures. They should not grow up never having thought theolo the the theologically. Our, our kids, yes, we should shelter them, but we should also be teaching them. Big difference. So that way when they go off to college, it's not the first time they've ever even considered what they believe and why they believe it. So once again, and I know I kind of preach this uh, all the time, but Christian parents need to get on the ball. And we need to stop assuming, well, they're going to learn Sunday school, or they're going to learn the Christian school, or they're going to learn from whoever you think is going to teach them. It's your responsibility. We are supposed to teach our kids and prepare them for life. So once again, the church is reminded that we need to wake up. It's high time that we woke up and that we took seriously our responsibility before the Lord. See you next week. Signing off, make your calling and election sure.